All right, good evening everyone. I'm Dylan, and I work with Alaska Pacific University's Nordic Ski Center. And as Travis said, I'm going to talk about uh, why uh, one snow is slippery, and then how we can have fun with that slipperiness, because skiing is, of course, uh, just utilizing that low friction to play on snow, travel on snow, and get around on snow. So, I'm going backwards. You got backwards. Let's get back to the front here. So I'm just pressing the button. So we have with snow high compression strength, low shear strength, and there's also a wet boundary on it. So um, with uh, water, you have a, a point with pressure and temperature where even at uh, below freezing temperatures, you can still have a uh, thin microscopic layer of free water on the, <coughs> on the snow. Um, so what affects snow's speed for skiing, in terms of skiing? Well, uh, when snow falls, of course, it's loose, uh, uncompacted. Right, and so there's a mechanical friction there uh, that most people would think of as plowing or compaction that uh, right, inhibits uh, some free travel. There's the dry friction, and this is the uh, roughness basically of the, of the base of the ski and then also of the snow. Right, the ski, these are not fully smooth surfaces. They might feel smooth, but on a microscopic level, they still have uh, peaks and valleys, roughness to them that creates drag or friction. There's capillary action, which um, the mug of beer, if you were to take your glass, and if there's a puddle of water on the table, you can feel um, that there's resistance, right, when you lift against this action. Um, if it's dry, you probably won't feel that at all. And so this happens with the base of um, a, uh, a ski and the snow as well. Dirt, so snow is not necessarily just pure water. There's dust, of course, that's the uh, nucleus for snowflakes, but also there's atmospheric pollutants, um, all in um, grit, you know, plowed off the road. There can be salt from the ocean. Anything can, can enter the snow. That also creates its own friction against the ski. And then there's electrostatic uh, charge that can build up as skis reach higher and higher speeds, electrostatic charge can start as low as 15 miles per hour um, and then build up uh, from there. The um, electrostatic charge, its you can think of it as like just another velcroing effect for the ski base. Okay, so here we have some guys, they're, uh, they're not athletes, they're going to go and test skis and wax. Um, these guys work for the Norwegian National Cross Country Ski Team. Behind them is their wax truck, which is an 18-wheeler outfitted completely for ski waxing, stone grinding. Um, you know, they have a 12 million dollar year budget. That's how they choose to spend it. Um, so, with that, you would think that uh, you can see all the pairs of skis are going to go out, go out and test. They're going to test a bunch of different factors. They're going to test. Um, the skis themselves are going to test the glide of the wax, they're going to probably test the stick wax since it's cross country skiing, um, and they're going to look at the structure of the ski base. So you would think that um, with that, that's the, the most important factor, right? They're putting all this time and effort into it. But here I've ranked um, the factors for skiing at speed in their order of importance. So the most important factor is the skier, the second most important factor is the ski, the third most important factor is the structure and condition of the base, and then the least important factor is the wax, which is the, the lubricant, right, against the snow, it's a further friction reducer. So that, that's interesting. Um, one of the things that uh, for this order is with the wax, that maybe only makes up 3% of ski speed. And that 3%, say if you're doing a 50 kilometer race, the men's field does a 50 kilometer race in two hours, and so 120 minutes, 3%, be 3% off, well, 
past six minutes, you can really feel out of the race right at that point. And, uh, all right, so let's talk about the skier. Uh, here we have an example of some skiers at uh, a high level. This is what, um, of course, the ski on its own goes nowhere. If it's sitting on the flat, we've probably all had the experience of having a ski on a slope, and it gets away from you, runs off down the slope. But that's just a tool being dropped, right? That's not, not actually making good speed. Um, so we have Lindsey Vaughn in the upper left. Uh, Lindsey Vaughn, of course, is from the United States, multiple gold medalist, World Cup overall champion. Uh, here showing someone going very, very fast on snow. Um, lower left corner, Petter Northug of Norway. Again, multiple champion, uh, looks pretty fit. Uh, upper left corner, that's Keegan, out summer training on the roller skis. Also looks pretty fit. And the bottom, bottom corner there, that's Herman Meyer of Austria. He's retired now. And what he's doing there is juggling shot puts. <laughs> 16 pounds. <laughs> but the reason I... The skier is so important, right, is that... Um, this is... Right? This is what makes the ski go, right? Without the coordination, the body awareness, the strength, the stamina, the power, um, all built up through training, um, and also the, you could say, uh, courage, right, to ski so fast. Uh, you know, on Nordic skis, top speeds can be reached at 50 miles per hour on the largest downhills. On uh, Alpine skis, 100 miles per hour. And then on speed skiing skis, 150 miles an hour have been reached. And so, to uh, control those forces, right, to strength and stamina, that doesn't mean skiing is not for everyone. This is just how we're talking about pure speed, and to make pure speed, this helps. Okay, factor two, the ski. All right, so ski, right, we, we're dealing with a surface uh, on snow that has, um, that can be somewhat loose, right, in the, if you're backcountry skiing, it's all loose snow unless it's already been tracked. If you're on uh, machine groomed snow, it can be firmer but still have give to it. If it's very old snow, it can be icy. If it's an alpine race course, it can be scraped off down to ice and salted to make it exceptionally fast and interesting. Um, so what are the factors that go into making a good ski? Flex, that's a, a very important factor. And this is the graphic here. This is just a, a very simple representation. We have a camber. And so the ski is bent, right? It's a bent plank, and that distributes pressure on the snow differently than if it was just a no camber ski completely flat, or a reverse camber ski, also called rocker. Kayaks have that, a lot of boats have rocker. And so uh, what would the difference be? Well, the rocker ski in very deep snow, that would help lift the ski up out of the snow, much like a water ski is lifted out of the water. Um, no camber, well, that would probably just be kind of a a bad ski overall because it would just have a lot of surface drag all the time and, and not have a lot of redeeming characteristics. And then the um, uh, camber, the plus camber, above the snow gives you uh, more control over the ski. It changes the distribution of pressure in the ski against the snow and so that you can build up the, um, the, the speed necessary, right? You can have that free, little bit of free water on the snow surface help you out. And so on ice as well, that would give you give you control. Um, fit. Ski needs to fit you, right? You can have a camber, camber ski, right? But if you're a very small person, right, very light, and the ski is made for someone who's big and heavy, then you're just always standing on top, and you never get that distribution of pressure that you're looking for through the ski. And so having a ski that matches you the same could be said you're a big, big, heavy person, and you're on a ski that is um, too soft for you, say it's a no camber ski, and you stand on it, it turns into a reverse camber ski on uh, icy conditions, that ski is not going to behave very well for you, that's also going to cause low speed. Materials used, that's the third one. So skis, human beings have had skis, archaeological evidence suggests for 10,000 years. Um, that's predated the wheel by 3,000 years, potentially, maybe more. And the uh, we've been building skis for a long time, mostly out of wood until the last 50 years when synthetic materials came available. And so 
materials have a big effect then, right, on the friction involved. Wood, if polished properly, if uh, sealed with uh, pine tar, which is hydrophobic, can be pretty fast over snow. But they won't be as fast as a extruded plastic base, which was the early plastics these were made out of, or today a cinctured base, which is made out of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene as the best, best speed. So let's talk about factor uh, three. After skis, structure and base, what makes a good ski base? And so as I said, um, modern plastics have uh, the best uh, characteristics of friction against the snow. They're used in a lot of industrial applications, but ski bases is one of them. Um, and then on it, what we have here is you can see that groove patterning along the base, and that's called structure. And that can be machine ground into the base or pressed in with hand tools to make a, a pattern. And this can serve two things. One, in cold snow, where there's very little free moisture or to none available, then you'll need uh, very fine or narrow grooves to maybe no grooves to be able to create enough of that free, slippery water to slide over the snow. And then in wet, warm conditions where you have a lot of free water naturally in the snow, sunny out, it's hot, melting, you need wide grooves to reduce the total contact with the surface of the snow so the ski's not creating extra um, what we call suction with free water or, um, and also to, to break up any free water on the bottom of the ski and shunt it away and break up that potential capillary effect. Roughness and damage, that's the other thing with ski bases that create drag on a obviously visual level is any sort of rip or groove in the ski is going to catch snow crystal and create friction and drag that way. Okay, factor four, wax. And there are lots and lots of types of wax out there. And um, so what makes a good ski wax? And then there's a bunch, there's of course gliding kick. If you're looking just for speed, kick's not important, you just work with glide. If you're looking to, to climb hills in the traditional Nordic style, um, feed back and forth, then you're looking at kick wax. Um, wax is generally determined entirely on hardness um, is the first factor. And so the wax needs to be harder than the snow, but not so hard that it doesn't have easy um, internal friction, or uh, low internal friction. And, um, and that's, to, of course, the temperature on a lot of factors that with temperature and snow shape. Uh, waxing is, I think, for most people, a big turnoff to the sport. It's, uh, you walk, you have this wall of products, they all cost a lot of money, and it's, everyone buys waxless skis, or it doesn't bother. Um, Wax does make a difference, but it doesn't need to be complicated. A lot of the innovation in waxing is race-driven, and so um, people have been you know, using lubricants on things since the earliest wheels, using animal fats on axles, probably the same on skis, and it wasn't until uh, the industrial age, kind of the advent of modern ski competitions, that you see this explosion of proliferation of waxing products. Um, and so there's no need to, to panic with it. Wax, um, like snow, has high compressional strength and low shear strength. And so if you think of wax uh, like a deck of cards, right, they can just kind of come off in sheets, right? So this is your lubricant. It's the same um, as any, any application where you need some sort of friction to do so. Um, what we have is the graphic two. We have the ski base, it's mostly made out of carbon. And then we have long chains, the waxes of hydrocarbons, and also hydrofluorocarbons, which is uh, a little bit fancier type of wax that also has uh, more hydrophobic properties. Um, the basically to connect uh, with the ski base, and the ski base has both crystalline zones of plastic and amorphous zones of plastic. The wax is melted in the amorphous zones. Um, Hydrocarbons bond, or initially go in best. On top of that, you can use fluorocarbons. On top of that, pure fluorocarbons, and then liquid fluorocarbons. And so that by the time you have a uh, high-end racing pair of skis for a big race, maybe you have five layers of wax and different product on the ski, um, which seems like a lot for a factor that's maybe three percent of importance. But when the margins are slim, it does make a difference. 
for general enjoyment, it probably just you know needs a basic wax to help and last. I expect to get 100 kilometers out of my skis uh, for a layer of wax. Yeah. All right. So wax also is affected by snow, and this is uh, particularly important than um, kick wax, right? So with kick wax, we have sharp snow crystals and then they age over time to round snow crystals and so a lot of people grab their tin of wax it says for fresh and fine grained snow which is you know like well what is it when it's not fresh and fine grained snow which sometimes it is well that wax is not designed then for that snow condition and so there's another other types of waxes poster waxes or grooves that um, are designed to, to compress around those round snow crystals sharp fresh snow crystal you can cut the wax very easily right and so you can grab stick that way very quickly with a round snow crystal it won't cut into the wax surface so you need something that deforms and compresses around it and that's with the, the kick wax you have that with glide wax you also have the effect where new snow can act a lot like cold snow because of its, its sharpness it can, can spear the wax if it's too soft the glide wax and bring it to a stop well, with old snow, generally there's a lot of moisture involved as well. Softer wax is better because then those deck of that deck of cards shears away. All right. So with waxing, the best is to keep it simple. Uh, to overthink it, you're dealing with so many factors: or atmospheric conditions, pressure, temperature, uh, amount of sunlight on the snow, wind, transformation of the snowpack. With grooming machines, you can get mixing of the snowpack, and so you have multiple types of snow crystal um, all present on the surface that you're dealing with. Best just to kind of go, um, either you test like those guys with the truck are testing, and they're going to spend many hours out there figuring things out, or you use your intuition and your knowledge, and you just say, you know, this is what's right, this is what I'm going to use. Um, and don't necessarily trust your neighbor, or do trust your neighbor, right? Because um, I think it's very easy to, to get caught up in hype around um, skis and uh, think that, you know, oh, the, they must know, right? They, they know, they said this. Well, maybe, maybe they know, but I would say that everyone has the ability to judge their own factors for what they would need for skiing. So, thank you very much. Well, that's